continue talking about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. And we've been talking about some causes of these problems. This time, let's focus on realistic conflict theory. In order to understand this theory, it helps to first talk about the Robbers Cave study. This is a famous study in social psychology. It was conducted by Musafer Sharif and his colleagues in 1954 in Robbers Cave State Park. And they were trying to study the effects of situations in which kids need to compete and situations in which kids need to cooperate. Let me give you some background information and then we'll go into a little bit more detail. This study involved two groups of 11-year-old boys. They named their groups and they named them the Eagles and the Rattlers. They were separated initially, but then they later on met for some competition. So a little bit more information now. Uh, first of all, these kids, they didn't know each other. So they came from different areas for a camp and they were randomly assigned into one of these two groups. Now they did not even know that there was another group on the campgrounds initially. So at first they spent the first week just with their group and they thought they were the only group on the campgrounds. And they did things that you would assume kids would do when they're camping. They were hiking, they were swimming, they were camping out. They were doing a variety of things so that they can get to know each other, have fun, and they really bonded. So I mentioned that they bonded so much that they gave their group uh, names. And the Eagles and the Rattlers went on to create you know, like flags to identify their group. And they even stenciled those names on their shirts. My point for going into that much detail is just to help you understand they really identified socially with that group. They had a very cohesive bond. So things got interesting during the second week. In the second week, the researchers who were serving as the camp counselors let them know that they were not the only group on the campgrounds. And they told them that they were going to meet this other group and they were going to meet them to compete in a variety of different contests. They're going to play things like football and baseball and tug of war. And they were told that as they competed, there was a point system that was arranged in this uh, tournament. And whichever team got the most points would win a big trophy. And they'd also win some other prizes that were really valued by these kids, like pocket knives. And all little kids, young boys, 11, love pocket knives. So it was a really highly charged environment because we had a cohesive group up against another cohesive group in a variety of uh, events, and they both really wanted to win these resources. Now, they were told that whichever group lost would receive nothing. So that added to that highly charged atmosphere. Now, what the researchers found was immediately after the competition began, there was instant hostility between the two groups. Of course, they talked trash and sometimes would get into little scuffles, but they did a variety of other things above and beyond that. They found each other's campgrounds and ransacked each other's cabins. They burned flags. Uh, they had food fights. They stole each other's properties. They hated each other. So this competition essentially bred hostility. Now, it bred so much hostility that the researchers realized they had to separate these groups for a couple days. So they had a little bit of a, a cooling off period while they were separated. Well, the researchers were able to see pretty easily that competition created an environment that really bred hostility and intergroup conflict. What they wanted to see now was how could they restore the peace? How could they reverse the environmental factors that led to such negativity? And how could they create a positive situation in which the kids would actually form some friendships? Well, they, they tried a few things. The first thing they tried was they just talked to each group about the other group and they let them know about their positive traits and, and good qualities. And as you would assume that that wasn't incredibly effective. This next idea seemed like it would have been much more effective. They let the groups get together to hang out with any, without any type of competition. So they got together just to get to know each other. Um, they played games. It was right around the 4th of July, so they saw fireworks and they saw movies together. But again, they still seemed to dislike each other and they failed to bond. And that was easy to see because they didn't interact with one another. And when they came together to eat, they would eat at separate tables with their groups. So neither of these things worked. What the researchers found that worked was they created some situations in which there were what we call superordinate goals. And superordinate goals are goals that can only be achieved through mutual cooperation. So the teams had to work together to meet these goals. And let me give you a couple examples. There was one situation in which they, they rigged their water system so it looked like it was vandalized and it was plugged up with a bunch of 
rags or something like that. And these kids were really thirsty because they were out together on a hike. So they had to work together to get the system to work properly. And it, it felt like this amazing goal that they accomplished once the water started flowing. And you were able to see that now they, they saw that they were kind of more friendly together because they were working together to achieve this goal. And it was really very interesting too because on this hike they set it up, they set up all these amazing details so that one group had canteens but the other group did not. Now the group that had canteens would fill up their canteens and then they would share them with the other group. So that was a good example that bringing the kids together to meet some shared objective helped them bond. Another thing they did was um, they had it set up so that the truck got stuck in some mud and the only way the truck was going to get out of the mud was if the kids took the ropes that they were using for tug of war and they tied it to the truck and then both the groups together pulled the truck out. So again, and they, they're all jumping for joy and high-fiving each other once they pulled that truck out and you can see that they bonded because they had to come together to achieve the shared goal. So superordinate goals were really very effective. And after those shared victories, the groups began to eat together, they were sharing resources, they were seeking out each other's company. The bottom line is they were, they were genuinely friends at that point. So we learned a lot uh, in that situation about how competition for scarce resources, those trophies, those pocket knives, could really breed intergroup conflict. And this is the basis for realistic conflict theory. Let's talk about that next. Realistic conflict theory is based on this whole idea that direct competition for valuable but limited resources breeds hostility and intergroup conflict. And we saw that in the Robbers Cave study. The kids were competing for trophies and pocket knives and things like that. Those were very valuable to them and they were limited because only the winners would receive those things. And that clearly led to conflict between those two groups. Now out there in the real world, what are some things that people are competing for? Jobs, mates, power, those would be three good examples. When it comes to jobs, it's really very interesting. Every group that has immigrated to our country over the years has come under fire for taking away American jobs. And this is a meme that just kind of makes fun of that. So when it comes to jobs, they are valuable resources and they are oftentimes very limited in any given community. So that's clearly going to be um, a factor that causes some competition between groups. Think about mates, single men who compete for local women often become very hostile when outsiders, particularly those of another race or religion, successfully attract mates. And that's because women are a valuable and oftentimes limited resource in any given community. Now, of course, it's the same for men, but women typically are less violent and cause less trouble. Here's another example here of power. People who, who uh, hold public office have access to quite a bit of social, economic, and political power. And it's no secret that many white people in our society felt threatened when Barack Obama became our country's first black president. So in this case, we're talking about a competition for power between different racial groups in our country. And for the first time, whites lost that most prized contest of the most powerful leader of the free world. So yeah, that's going to lead to some intergroup conflict as well. In these situations, when groups are competing, the losers become very frustrated and resentful. And the winners, although they won and they received the, the prized possession, they still feel threatened and become somewhat overly protective because they know that other groups are still vying for their resources. And that just creates an environment that, that breeds hostility, prejudice, conflict, and discrimination those things are likely to follow when people are competing for scarce resources. That's what realistic conflict theory is all about. It's interesting, when groups are competing for resources, direct competition is not always involved. Let me give you a couple examples. Sometimes the direct competition is simply imagined. So for example, here's another meme that kind of makes fun of this issue. So a lot of people are worried and complain that immigrants are stealing their jobs. And it says, tell me more about how you've always wanted to be a taxi driver. So that means actually, uh, you know, not politically correct, of course, because not all immigrants are taking low-level jobs. But, but what the point is that I'm trying to make is that um, even though people are really worried about this issue, that they're competing for jobs, there's often no competition directly for the jobs that these people are actually vying for or the jobs that these people actually hold. 
In other words, they still feel this conflict. They still feel that they're competing with other groups, even though that's really mostly imagined. Some of the conflict between groups is due to what we call relative deprivation. And what that has to do is with how people make relative comparisons about how their group is stacking up to another. Let me give you a couple examples. As blacks in our society become more successful, whites might feel that their relative status as a privileged class is in jeopardy. So that's likely to cause some whites to feel threatened. And when people feel threatened, they typically develop hostility toward the group that's posing that threat. That's just one example. Let me give you another one. As the rich become richer and the poor become poor, in our society, we are seeing more of a, a widening of that gap between the haves and the have-nots. It's likely that we'll see more social unrest when people see that their already meager lifestyle is threatened to become even worse. So in other words, as the poor people in our country perceive that there's even more distance between themselves and the American dream, they're likely going to develop hostility toward those who have money, resources, and in general success. That's what would be predicted by realistic conflict theory. All right, my friends, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. <laughs>